A few weeks ago, an article came out stating that everyone wants to make the next Limbo, referring to games like The Cub and Silt, which the journalist compares to Play Dead's 2010 classic, going as far as to propose a new genre, the Limbo-like. Effectively, this would forever link these games to their critically acclaimed predecessor. So is the something-like title fair? Does it help or does it undermine a game's identity? And does it even matter what genre a game is in the first place? Before we get into the video essay, I just wanted to jump in here and remind you to subscribe and like the video for more content like this every single month. It's free and really helps the channel grow. Thank you so much. Limbo started as a mood. Sketches of oppressive environments, outlines and shadows. Arndt Jensen had had enough of his job as an IO interactive concept artist. He felt trapped. So when the time came to carve out his own path, he started channeling that discontent into what would later become his first standalone passion project. Limbo was born out of that atmosphere. Everything else came directly out of that inky blackness. A couple of years into sketching and trying his hand at solo development, Jensen realized he was a bit in over his head and needed some help. With everything he had crafted alone so far, he put together a proof of concept video to help recruit a programmer. The gameplay and other features had yet to be snapped into place. It was just a simple environment of aggressive isolation and some stark assets at this point. The video spread like wildfire across the internet, and there was more support for this concept than Jensen could have ever foreseen. Eventually hiring a small team of highly talented game devs who also found themselves disillusioned with the industry at the time, Limbo slowly became what we know it as today, and Playdead was born right along with it. All because of this palpable atmosphere and a passion to create something different. Now one of the most recognizable names in the indie gaming scene, Limbo's story is inspiring almost mythological on a lot of levels. It's the success story that all indie developers dream of. So it's really no wonder that Playdead's classic has had so much influence on other indie developers. Clearly Limbo's success showed other game devs that independently created and funded games were marketable, and passion coupled with a great idea could get you a long way. So, of course, future titles would find a lot of inspiration here. Limbo has been credited by a lot of people for introducing them to the concept of indie video games in the first place. Silt is a great example of a game that wears its influences on its sleeve while still blazing its own trail in a lot of different ways. This is Dom Clark, the technical director at Spiral Circus, the development team that created Silt. I had the chance to sit down with him and discuss Silt's release, the comparisons to Limbo, and the four-year development of this game. We started in 2018, I think. It was more of just this, it combined with just getting fed up at the science job as well, right? And like wanting to change. I was like ready to move on from that job and try something else. And I guess I was learning to program a lot. So I was into the idea of trying to make a game. So yeah, uh, at that time I met Tom and he, he was like working as an artist in Bristol. So like just knew his stuff from seeing it around our city. And like, we just happened to end up at a party together and like, I cornered him and basically said like, please make a game with me. While we were doing that like part time, you know, evenings and weekends sort of stuff, um, we were building up little tiny, you know, I was just doing loads of visual tests, like the, how do we get Tom's art to like, look like that in, in a game and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we were sort of forming up the idea and the concept, and the kind of, you know, the space that we were going to work in. Um, in the UK, there's a couple of little pots of money, like here's 5,000 pounds to like develop a pitch. Um, so, you know, you can pay like a graphic designer to make a portfolio for you or something, you know, so it takes some amount of money to like ask for more money, right? We started applying for things, but the best thing we got was this, um, it's called a um, Stugan. It's this games accelerator program that was running in Sweden at the time. This is the Stugan summer camp program Dom is talking about. It's held in an off-season ski lodge in Sweden. A handful of solo devs and teams of two or three with outstanding concepts were picked every year to work on their game's pitches and demos here. A boot camp to get their indie projects funded by investors or publishers. Here's some of the other games that were also born out of that summer's program. 
was um, it was lovely. I think um, genuinely altruistic, like to the point that I think our families, when they heard that we'd gotten it, were like, "What? What's the catch? Is this a cult? Are you gonna just get murdered in the forest? <laughs> like, is this midsummer stuff gonna happen to you?" Right. And that's where we met Fireshine, and we just basically just kept talking after that. They had the two scouts that we met were really interested in the game, and they believed in it, and they they pitched it to their superiors, and I guess eventually we um, we got a deal going and signed a publishing contract with them, which is how we got the game made. We wouldn't we wouldn't have managed it without that. I don't think we needed money. We talked about the environmental storytelling of Silt, something that a lot of people have used as a comparison to Limbo as well. It's what we want to do. Like it's it's on purpose. It's a kind of storytelling. String together enough like threads, enough things that make sense next when it's seen next to each other that it starts to like make the person watching it have their own connections and stuff, right? And it sounds really it's you know, it sounds kind of pretentious to talk about like, oh you leave it all up into the you into the players' heads or whatever, but like in a lot of the I think a lot of the time we think we want somebody to explain everything to us, but you would actually hate it if everyone did that. But there's another thing about indie games that I think people always forget is that indie studios are just constantly, constantly trying to get away with um, doing, like they don't have enough money and people to do massive, massive things. So you start to think like, what can I do under my constraints that I have in this tiny little studio? that can seem like it's this really big thing but like i can't actually afford a, like an animated cutscene with a voice actor right like we can't do that in in no in no world could we have done that in silk um so so you have to write a story that doesn't have that and so that automatically lends it to being more vague and you know we're not going to have a, a like text scroll every every you know two levels or something so this is this is what you get. You get you get something that's lots of very carefully positioned imagery. Uh, but the idea is that as long as the imagery is coherent, like that's our job. Make the make the the edit the whole thing as a whole feel like a continuous coherent world. And you know, I, I don't know whether we succeeded, but that was the goal. Um, and I think that's what Limbo did really well. Certainly, Inside did it even better. I think maybe. Um, and we, yeah, you see that from loads of really great pieces of art. So we got a lot of mileage out of just, uh, you know, essentially having a really dark room and then having a couple of spots of really bright blooming out white and like, you know, the, the diver's possession effect being real bright while everything else was dark. And it just, it almost always makes something that looks nice on the screen. I think with color, you can end up just with a lot of visual noise and a lot of like difficulty kind of reading stuff. And, you know, that being said, there are limitations. There's only so many shades of gray that you can use to differentiate different materials and all that kind of stuff. I think mostly where we suffered, though, was the, um, uh, you know, the the usual kind of player expectations about how games communicate mechanics to you and stuff like that. The poison being the most obvious example. I also wanted to know how Dom felt about so many people drawing the comparison between Silt and Playdead's Limbo. I think it's just an amazing game, and you know, if you're mentioned in the same breath as some some something that you think is really cool, and you're like, all right, so black and white side scroller, and it's swimming, and it's and it's like. You know, it, it's it gives people like a place to start, and then I think pretty much in every one of those reviews, somebody said something about well, as soon as you start playing it, it has certain similarities, but you realise that they've gone for a completely different sort of game. But the comparison is really, really, I think it's really well received. Like, I receive it really well because Limbo is a touchstone of a game, right? Like, if we could ever, like, that's why it keeps coming up, and it's it's 11 years old, and if that's the place that somebody has to go to say. Like I'd much rather them say it's like, like use Limbo as a reference point than to just like name a genre or something, you know? Oh, it's like it's a puzzle platformer or something. I think what I'd be sad about is if they'd been like, this game is clearly ripping off Limbo, or this game is clearly just trying to do Limbo but worse or something, right? Um, but I don't think anyone's really said that. I think they've been they've been kind of kind and they've said like, right, Limbo is a great place to start thinking about what this game is like. But if you play it for any length of time, you realize, oh, the art is making very different choices and the mechanics are different and like it's a different game. And again, testament to like how good Limbo actually is, is that it was able to become almost a myth of a game in these people's heads. Yeah, it's a bit of a mix. I think um, I love being compared to Limbo, but I like it when they go a little further and like talk about the differences too, you know? So it's way more like Abzu than it is like Limbo, Limbo totally. as well, like structurally. Totally. And we have similar goals in terms of the kind of pacing and the, the, the sort of 
the feeling of like the ambience of the game and everything. Like I think Abzu makes you want to play it slowly, and that's yeah. what we kind of wanted with Silt too. The, the surface level comparison draws us to Limbo because we have this high contrast monochrome thing. Yeah. Um, I really, I don't have a problem with it at all. Um, give a reader the chance to like find a reference point and say this is roughly where this is. Like because you can't describe everything about a game, so you say like it's Limbo meets Limbo meets Abzu, but in a lot of like uh, media criticism, it's not just about telling your reader what you think of this piece of art. It's about telling you whether you think they should buy it. If you want to hear the rest of this one-hour interview, there's a link down in the description. It's really interesting, and I'm really excited to get to be able to share this with you. But if the Limbo like does become its own genre. What tropes define it? What parts of the original game will constitute the DNA of an emerging genre? First and foremost, I'd venture to say that one of the biggest factors that makes Limbo stand out even today is a bleak and violently oppressive atmosphere. Most genres don't really constitute a specific aesthetic, but since Limbo's conception and sales pitch so heavily rely on the ever ephemeral vibe, I think it's only fair to consider this a tenant of the genre. Dark, brooding, no dialogue to provide you any comfort while you platform your way through this mysterious new world. Harsh surroundings that are out to brutalize you at every turn. And of course, environmental puzzles that halt your progression along the way. The environment is both your enemy and your toolbox. Playdead's games also work so well because of how short they are. They're the perfect length to remain mysterious and snappy, and functionally, that short runtime means they're much more likely to be highly polished as well. So a dark atmospheric puzzle platformer with a short runtime. If we're coining Limbo-like, I'd say these pillars of the genre would make the most sense. Playdead's inspiration is so widespread that even Playdead themselves are feeling like they need to change things up a bit which it looks like they're doing in a big way with the upcoming Cocoon. Most notably, ditching the 2D platforming aspect, the developers are going with a top-down 3D perspective, and a lot of other changes to their formula, if the Xbox showcase from June is anything to go by. Obviously, Limbo isn't the first game to have this kind of impact on the gaming genre at large. A game so wildly different from everything on the market that the next generation of developers can't help but draw from it. Games that don't fit into the gaming industry's mold, as Dark Souls director Hidetaka Miyazaki would say. Rogue, Super Metroid, Dark Souls, these gaming cornerstones all spawn their own genres. Although the most impactful genre birthing game might just be id Software's Doom. It wasn't the first first-person shooter, but it was certainly the first to refine the mechanics and perfect them. And the shareware aspect of its release meant that pretty much anyone with computer access had the ability to play this game. More importantly though, it was easy to mod. And in the 1990s, that wasn't the case for all computer games. People loved this game and wanted more of it. So they started making their own levels, distributing those as well adding custom assets, taking the DNA of Doom and creating their own titles. Doom had cultivated a dedicated mod community and inspired a lot of fledgling game developers to follow through with their ideas. So when a few years later, an avalanche of releases that looked and played very similarly to Doom came onto the market, some critics took issue and claimed these newcomers were ripoffs, asset flips, Doom clones, the title was tossed around for years as a derogatory critique of aping id Software's style. Even though the director of the game, John Romero, was a huge supporter of these up-and-coming creatives getting into the industry with the help of a game he created. Years down the line, when it was clear that these titles weren't just copies of Doom, people needed a new classification. There was enough innovation within the Doom likes to justify a standalone genre name. Games like Half-Life and Goldeneye had almost nothing in common after all, apart from being first-person shooters. Today, the genre mostly consists of games that barely resemble their 1993 origins. Even the recent updates to the Doom franchise feel fresh and innovative when it comes to the first-person shooter space. The genre has been around for long enough that a title like Doom Clone 
would no longer fully encapsulate where the genre is in its evolution. Especially now that no one is declaring a game like Neon White to be a Doom ripoff, despite that lineage definitely being there. The idea of using the like suffix to call something a ripoff is also not exactly constructive, because that implies that the point of origin is somehow already the gold standard of the genre, and asking us to compare all future offspring to the initial game. To me, a ripoff is something like what we see at the bottom of the Steam search results, the shovelware that isn't trying to do anything new, a game that's being held together with shoestrings and chewing gum to quickly hop on a trend. There's a clear difference between something like Neo and Barbarian Souls, for example, clearly inspired by FromSoft's Dark Souls, but one is a well-crafted game that wears its inspiration on its sleeve, and one is, well, not that. The disparity in quality between these shovelware titles and enduring additions to the genre is pretty obvious. But more often than not, these are first-time developers who fell in love with a game like Dark Souls so passionately that they wanted to give it a shot themselves. Which is commendable in theory, but the other side of the shovelware coin unfortunately is just capitalism at its finest. Seeing demand for something and putting together anything to fit that demand as quickly as possible, with no thought to quality at all. A quick cash grab to scam people who see the word souls in the title. But you know once you start seeing things like this in your Steam search results, you're well on your way to having a standalone genre. Recently, when I was streaming Tunic over on my Twitch channel, I was trying to fit this cute little Canadian indie into some kind of genre-shaped box, since a lot of people were coming in and asking if I would recommend this game to them. Spoiler alert, I do recommend it, it's great. But it was a surprisingly hard question for me to answer. Was it a Zelda-like? Or was it its own kind of thing entirely? And does genre even matter in the first place if you're enjoying a game? Well, as much as I'd like to say something like, genre doesn't matter, just play what you like. That's not how existing as a video game consumer really works. Video games aren't cheap, and they're getting more and more expensive over time. Especially when you start factoring in inflation and the cost of living steadily increasing too. And since I do stream and make these video essays, I end up having to buy a lot of video games while working a minimum wage service job. By the way, if you do want to help out, there's a Ko-fi page to help out the channel linked in the description. So I do like to know what I'm getting into before I make a purchase. And not enough titles have demos these days, so sometimes it's really difficult to know what's going to click with you before spending close to $100 for some of these games. And without anything else to go on a lot of times, Genre is usually a pretty good starting point for that. For example, if you tell me a game is a solid Metroidvania, I'm very likely to check it out. I know, a video essay is talking about how great Metroidvanias are, imagine. But ever since the Castlevania entries on the Nintendo DS, I've been a huge fan of the Metroidvania genre. The exploration of an interconnected map with progression based on learning new abilities unlocking certain doors very satisfying for me. But on the other hand, take a genre like roguelikes or even roguelites. They're not my favorite. Despite the procedurally generated and modular design, the repetition of having to start over and over again every time you die is soul crushing. And the mechanics of combat are almost never good enough for me to want to stick with a game for more than an afternoon or two. Even when I do feel myself getting better over time, I personally tend to find enjoyment through extrinsic progression of a good story or promise of leveling up my character, and I've tried enough highly regarded roguelikes that I've just realized it isn't the genre for me. The main tenets that make up that formula just aren't my thing. But then comes along a game like Hades. Supergiant's Greek mythology take on the roguelite mixed with a dating sim really piqued my interest and I played it all the way through until hitting credits, and even more after that, for more reasons than just the sexy gods, I swear. It's even got fishing. 
Hades is great, and for me, an exception to the genre rule. Maybe it's just like the trailer says. Maybe this really is a godlike roguelike. Uh, well, roguelite. There's always going to be exceptions to every rule. Like how I may not love on-rails shooters, but Pokemon Snap remains one of my childhood favorites. Using a genre as an indicator of interest is usually at least a good starting off point though. But genres, especially the something likes, can also be thrown around too liberally, leading to some frustrated customers. Tunic is actually a great example of a game that was hurt by this a bit. It was never marketed as a Zelda-like. It was just a game made with some very clear 2D Zelda influence, especially with the titular green garb, general aesthetic, and the importance of the manual. You'd be forgiven for thinking Finji's latest indie darling was a cute and cuddly ode to Zelda. And it is! But the word of mouth across the internet sure took that and applied the Zelda-like title to it. When really? Mechanically? More than anything else? It's a Souls-like at the core. So while those two genres are closer than they might seem on the surface, many of my streamer friends bought the game expecting one thing, but getting another. And that's not a great feeling. It's no fault to the developer, by the way. Nowhere in the game's marketing did Finji claim any sort of Zelda-like connection, but because the something-like title has become so easy to apply to anything these days, you often run into situations like this. Great games aren't allowed to stand on their own merits when the something-like title gets applied to them. And it's especially unhelpful when most of us can't even agree what constitutes one of these burgeoning genres. I asked on Twitter what you all thought the one most important thing about a Souls-like was, for example, and pretty much every single person had a different answer, including Iron Pineapple, the internet's leading Souls-like expert. And this just in, Dark Souls actually isn't a Souls-like. You heard it here first, folks. It's natural that an outstanding success in game design that bucks the trends of the day would influence a number of subsequent titles, both actual copycat shovelware and legitimate standalone titles that find inspiration in a well-made game. So genres sprouting up around standouts like Dark Souls and Limbo make a lot of sense. After all, the human brain naturally craves categorization. A lot of research suggests that we're wired to group things together to make the world around us easier to digest. People, events, and video games. So genres are bound to be formed when games play or feel similar in some way. But are we going to call all AAA open world games Ubisoft clones? Are we going to call all colorful, hyper-violent, fast-paced action games Hotline Miami likes? I hope not, because that has a terrible mouthfeel. And not to mention, naming an entire genre after one game implies that we should be holding up one game in particular as the gold standard and measuring up all others against it. That's unfair not only to the games being categorized, but also the original. It implies something like Dark Souls is a perfect game, and just like... No. So Limbo-like. Should it be a thing? If you ask me, I'd say let's call it something else, like gloomy puzzle platformer. Nah, that's too long. Gloomformer? No, that's awful. Uh, Post-horror puzzler? No. Uh, what do you think? Do you think genre should matter? Tell me in the comments. Anyway, thank you so much for watching the video essay. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please go ahead and give the video a like and subscribe to the channel. I put over 40 plus hours into getting these videos out on the first Saturday of every single month. So your support would mean the world. Sharing the video helps a lot too. It's because of your support that I was able to sit down with Dom and film that interview that you saw. We talked about the development of Silt from idea to finished product and everything in between. And it was like over an hour. So if you do wanna hear the entire interview, I did upload it to my Ko-fi page for my monthly supporters, which is only $4 a month. And speaking of that, thank you so much to my monthly supporters over on that Ko-fi page who make these videos possible every month. Thank you to Voxamandius, Puzzled Monkey, Tree, Mum Pow, Oyster Milk, Deer Papaya, Nightmare God, Bean Fiello, Alien, Damn Amazing, Velt Walker, A Werewolf, and Cap Danvers. 
And if you'd like to join as well, you'll get monthly shoutouts at the end of these videos, extra content like that full interview, as well as outtakes for my voiceover recordings, and sneak peeks at upcoming content. Also, if you want to check out any of the games I mentioned in any of my video essays, there are always affiliate links down in the description. They help support the channel and give back to charity at no extra cost to you. Plus, there's sometimes sales on there that Steam doesn't have, so it's worth checking out. Anyway, thank you again. I had a lot of fun making this video, so I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.